Hello again, Gary Stearman with another Prophecy in the News daily update. It is Wednesday, December 21st, and uh, we're going to be running this update all the way through the Christmas holiday. In fact, uh, Bob Ulrich is in studio with me, and because we want to take a few days off this Christmas, we're just going to let this update run right on through the holiday. Bob, uh, we've got something really special to talk about today. Well, I think it's going to be an interesting update and something that's going to be worth repeating because uh, you've given us another spectacular series of articles in the December issue of Prophecy in the News, and we're definitely going to want to take a look at the cover of that magazine well, because it's spectacular. It, here we have a, uh, a wonderful cover that shows gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And on the inside uh, of the magazine, we have an article on those mysterious magi, followed by the real Christmas story in which we tell the story of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Uh, Bob, the magi, what a wonderful Christmas story that is. The, the, uh, the wise men who came bearing gifts. And, you know, we smile when we think about the wise men because they're often shown riding on camels. There are three of them bringing three gifts and they bring their gifts to the manger scene in Bethlehem. And in fact, that's fictitious. It just didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. You know, Gary, it's kind of funny if, uh, you know, the three wise men, supposedly the three wise men of the, the biblical account, have been replaced by uh, Santa, Frosty, and Rudolph. And if you drive around a neighborhood today and see the Christmas lights, you don't see too many manger scenes anymore, do you? No, you don't. And it's, it's kind of startling because, uh, you know, we're both old enough to easily remember the manger scenes. were very traditional. Every church had one. Uh, all the neighbors, you know, had some form of a little crash in a manger scene. It just isn't there anymore. Well, Gary, most people are not going to, have never have heard what you're going to tell us today. And, and I read your article, and to be honest with you, I was a little flabbergasted by some of the information in there. Tell us about that traditional manger scene and, and well, why that doesn't quite fit the pattern of the Bible account. You read about the manger scene in Luke chapter 2, where the shepherds are watching over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord comes and makes the announcement to him, uh, to them that the Christ has been born. Now, those shepherds are not just any shepherds. Those shepherds are shepherds at Bethlehem in a place called Migdal Adair, the Tower of the Flock. And the angel comes to make an announcement to the shepherds that the king has been born. Well, they come and they uh, appear at the manger and they adore the newborn king. These shepherds are the shepherds who routinely uh, prepared the baby lambs who were born at the temple, uh, at, at the place called Migdal Adair, where temple sheep were raised. And they used swaddling clothes, <coughs> as mentioned in the Bible, to wipe off the sheep a after they were born. And, uh, and that was the process of examining a sheep to see if it had any blemishes and was fit for sacrifice. And so Jesus was laid in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. And very few people understand that swaddling clothes were very technically uh, oriented. That is, they were used by the shepherds to dry off the newborn sheep to determine whether they were fit for sacrifice and so forth. And so we have here Jesus being born at the Tower of the Flock in Bethlehem and the shepherds attending. But there are no wise men. There are no magi. Nobody so the, there so at the all. shepherds are at the manger scene, but the wise men are nowhere to be found. And in fact, to find them, you have to go back to, uh, to Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men came to town 15 months later. Now, you've got to remember, they started their journey in Persia they came up about a thousand strong. They had tents, they had wagons, they had chuck wagons, they had sleeping wagons, they had a cavalry. There were over, uh, most historical authorities say there were over a hundred magi. They all rode uh, the precursors of the Arabian horses. They were horse breeders. They hated camels, would never have gotten aboard a camel. And so they came in force and in strength with their own cavalry. They rode into Jerusalem and they rode up to Herod's palace, and they demanded to know, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, it's about 15 months after Jesus was laid in a manger. So th that's a long time has passed. Uh, well, a 1,200-mile trip on an Arabian steed 
isn't accomplished overnight. So we can only assume that the preparation time to leave and then the trip, you know, down uh, to see the baby Jesus. He was no longer a baby at that point. He was a toddler who was probably walking and talking. Now Herod, who, has, who had bought his way into the office of king of the Jews, was terrified because these men were king, kingmakers. They, they were the most powerful men in the Middle East, even throughout the Roman Empire. They were known as kingmakers. And they had come to honor the one who was to become king. And they rode on down to Bethlehem. They arrived there, and they presented gifts. Now, here's something interesting. Verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary. They're in a house, and Jesus is described as a young child, Pideon, which means he's a toddler by this time. He's not a little baby. He's probably walking around talking. And the verse continues, they saw Mary, his mother, they fell down, they worshiped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, the gift to a king, it was the gift of a monarch. Frankincense, the gift to a priest, it was the temple ketoret, uh, uh, or incense, it was made of, fra of frankincense. And finally, myrrh, uh, the herb that was used in death and burial. <clears throat> and by the way, this spoke of the death that Jesus would have to suffer before he rose again. So these three gifts by the Magi were prophecies of his, his kingship, his priesthood, and his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, it's fascinating to me how these, these little tidbits in the story that are never really brought out are so prophetic. You know those, those swaddling clothes that Jesus was wrapped in? Yeah. There was going to be a point a few years later where he was wrapped in those strips of cloth again, and that was at his burial. That's with the same materials, those strips of cloth, yeah. that they buried Jesus in. So he was born in swaddling clothes. He died in the same material. And here we have the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh. Each one fulfills a specific pattern in the Scripture that you have to know the future as only God does, to really understand the significance of that. Now, when we give gifts to each other at, at Christmas, essentially we are honoring each other. And the gifts, or the tradition of gift giving, uh, is in the spirit of the Magi who gave gifts to the newborn king. Uh, gifts are also reminiscent of the gift that God gave to us, the gift of eternal life. He gave gifts to man. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave uh, pastors and teachers. He gave the gift of the church. Uh, we are so blessed. It's unbelievable. And that's what we try to remember this time of the year when we give gifts. Uh, going out today, I want Bob to, uh, to show you something that a lot of people have been giving as gifts, and we want to share this with you. Uh, and Bob, you've got something really special to tell people about. Well, I do. We have a, a good friend that a lot of people are familiar with, Danny Benjigi from Hebrew World. And uh, about a year ago, Danny visited his homeland of uh, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And he met an old family friend there whose family had an ancient recipe for, of all things, frankincense and myrrh. Wow. And this had laid dormant for almost 100 years. The family had just stopped producing it. I don't know if it got to be too expensive or too much trouble. But he, uh, he told me that he begged his friend to reinstitute this formula and to begin producing this again and importing it just for him at Hebrew World. So Danny actually has produced now, straight from the Holy Land, this ancient biblical recipe for frankincense and myrrh. And I'm holding these, these beautiful bottles here. And, uh, you know, glass frosted bottles, just uh, not only are they beautiful, but when you smell these, I mean, it really is an extraordinary fragrance. Uh, I've shared these with my wife, my mother, my sister, Linda Church, all the ladies mm -hmm. out front at the ministry, and everyone who smells them just says the same thing. That is so different. Yeah. It's just so extraordinary and special. Uh, I've, I can tell you this, I've probably already bought five or six bottles of this for my wife. When it runs out, I just kind of get the look, you know, in the empty bottle in her hand, and I know what to do. But it really is really unique. They're thirty-four ninety-five for each of the frankincense and the myrrh bottles. And I guarantee you this will be a great Christmas gift, a great, great gift after Christmas. Well, we, uh, we think it's the season to kind of offer those. And, and in the spirit of the gifts of the Magi, 
We hope uh, that you have a, a terrifically blessed Christmas season. Uh, and we hope that uh, you really experience the love of the Lord and the spirit of true gift giving. Uh, gift giving can become just a hassle, it can, can become just a formality. But in the spirit of Christmas, uh, we express our love one to another, and we remember those great gifts that were given uh, when Jesus came into the world. Bob, you and your family have a Merry Christmas. The same to you, Gary. And all of you as well. And by the way, even though it's the holiday, we never quit looking up. Mm -hmm.